Welcome back. For session three, we're going to continue with our marination in the text of Genesis. Marination? Rumination? <laughs> we're going through it slowly. And we're trying to soak it in, right? So maybe marinate is the right word. Pick up where we were in the unfolding narrative of sin and see what we can learn from Adam and Eve's first touch with sin. So Genesis 3, verse 7 through 13. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I ate. There's so much we could say about this interaction between God and humans and their first failure, their first sin. A couple of real quick exegetical notes before we dive in and reflect deeply about the human condition and God's response. One is this odd phrase, cool of the day. The Hebrew construction here is really kind of hard to get it's a bit of a forced translation, but it's a it's a common one. It's worth mentioning that I encountered the work of a scholar named Jeffrey Niehaus, and he suggests that this phrase "la ruach hayam" is is that's a forced translation, and, and maybe we should read this as a judgment theophany. It's often that God appears in scenes where there's a storm, and perhaps this wind of the day, as it's literally in the Hebrew, is something more like a a storm of judgment coming up, according to him. So I, I don't know if that tampers with your picture of God's response, but God is responding. There is a response to sin, and we're going to look at that in more detail later, and not all of it hinges on that particular word or picture. So we'll hold on to that, and we'll return to God's response to sin in just a moment. Another thing to note here that I think is worth mentioning, and, and we're going to dive into the effects of sin at a later session, but notice just right off off the bat how Adam is blaming Eve and Eve is blaming the serpent. And it seems like the fault is the buck to pass around and everybody's got Teflon. Nothing's sticking to them. And I just notice that self-preservation tendency in Adam and Eve here they're already trying to protect themselves rather than admit the truth in their complicity. Well, their first response is to hide. They realized they were naked, something that they hadn't felt shame for to this point. But now as they survey their own bodies, they feel shame. This is the first consequence of sin, shame. The desire to hide oneself from others, someone as intimate as your spouse or your God. The voice of, of God, what do they do in response to it? The voice that created the universe, the voice that spoke them into existence, the voice that, that crowned them as made in the image of God, that voice, they're hiding from it. They're hiding from the voice that gave them life. And they hid here from the presence of God. The word for presence in Hebrew, it's the same word for face. There's a lot of facial language in Hebrew manner of speaking, Hebrew idiom. And they're hiding from the face of God. They don't want to face God. Do you see this sense, the weight, the change, the shutting down of their relationships as a result of sin? This is the first result of sin. This is the way death starts 
to represent itself, to appear in the lives of humans. Isolation. The word we read for hiddenness is it's obviously associated with the idea of darkness. They want to cover themselves in darkness. They sew for themselves garments made out of fig leaves. Now the word here for garment is quite a skimpy garment. It could be a, a loincloth or some sort of belt that's often used to describe belts. So you're not talking about much here. So just feel the shame of Adam and Eve for a moment, and you're trying to cover up with all that you can find, and fig leaves have a pretty wide fan to them. So you grab these leaves, and it still really isn't covering much. Has this ever been your experience with sin? Do you try to hide yourself when you're in sin, when you feel shame? And has that hiding of yourself really been adequate? Has it worked? There's something deeply resonant about Adam and Eve's search for proper clothing. The desire for humanity to recover some of its dignity, its own response to shame and sin. So if we're to trace the effects of sin in the disposition and the relationships of Adam and Eve, what we find unnervingly so about the human condition in its fallen state is that humanity prefers darkness, anonymity, hiddenness. Isn't it true of the human condition that when we feel shame, we don't rush into the light, we don't show people our wounds? We often feel uncomfortable with the concept of vulnerability or transparency, but rather we try to clothe ourselves. And if we think a bit here, maybe some helpful construct we could think about a bit is the idea of a false self. That I don't want you to see who I really am, so I'm gonna put on things, regardless of how well that actually hides my true self, I'm gonna put on things to stay hidden because I don't want you to see my shameful true self. D do any of you resonate with that? Has that been part of your response to sin? So it's in human nature. When we realize our inadequacies and our brokenness, to put on a false self, something that isn't really us, something that doesn't really cover us, that doesn't really address our issues, but to put on a front. Have you ever done that in response to sin? So, as I said, we would return to God's response. Did you notice what God does? He asked the first question, where are you? Whether or not we envision God walking around in the cool of the day, or whether he's moving back and forth in a judgment theophany storm, his voice comes out the same. Where are you? It's an invitation. He is inviting Adam and Eve out of the shadows and into his light. Don't you think God knows where they are? Don't you think this creator God knows where these humans are hiding in the garden he made? The question isn't for his sake, it's for theirs. It's to give them an opportunity to respond to him willingly. Where are you? We could view God's question, his invitation, as a summons to confession, to coming into the light. Let's read a couple of passages as we, we think about confession, about the possible response of Adam and Eve, and, and they really fumble with it. They don't really want to own their sin. They don't do a, a good job confessing because Adam says it's Eve and Eve says it's the serpent, and they're all involved. And so what we hear from Adam and Eve isn't really a true confession. It's partially the truth, but they don't own their own sin per se. They're interested in self-preservation. But confession is the opportunity God set up. It is this response you see throughout the Bible to approach God willingly, eagerly, to step out of the darkness and away from the hiding and to step towards him in order to show him our shame and invite him to restore our dignity.
And I want to add that confession is not just something we do with God alone. Throughout the scriptures, confession is something experienced by the community. It is the movement away from relational isolation and severing ourselves off into our own self-preservation darkness bubbles. And it is the move towards relationship in the honest, vulnerable, and even feeling like naked kind of transparency that says, I, I am a sinner. I am broken. Here are my wounds. In First John, he, he writes of this movement out of the darkness and into the light. Confession is such a movement. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Do you see this response to sin that's available to us? To move into the light? James talks about this as if confession is, is necessary in our response to sin. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We need not slink around in the shadows, though that is, as we know, our fallen human nature. We want to be hidden. We want to remain in the dark. We don't want people to see us in our shame. But what the biblical authors, at the invitation of God, describe over and over again is the healing purifying communal beauty experienced when we come into the light and confess to God and to one another. I'm reminded, of course, of a really poignant quote from our dear friend Tolkien. Aragorn has seen something very dark and he comes and sits at the table and he remains silent for a while. And Legolas invites him to shake off the shadows. Let me read this. Come, said Legolas at last. Speak and be comforted and shake off the shadow. I think that's the spirit of confession. That we are peeling off the darkness. That we're not allowing it to continue to isolate and drive us away from each other and God. What confession does as a response to sin is to shine a light. Have you ever experienced the spiritual practice of confession? Have you ever allowed the shadows to, to shake off of you, feel the weightlessness of being bare before God and each other? That's what Adam and Eve could have done. And that's the invitation of God for you to come into the light, to confess your sin, and to shake off the shadow and be healed. So what does God do? Well, there's a wardrobe problem. There's a wardrobe malfunction. Adam and Eve have fashioned for themselves their own really skimpy and piecemeal clothes. And again, we could think of this as some sort of desperate attempt to give themselves some sense of dignity, shielding themselves from one another and from God. And God responds. After he's spoken, he does something for them. He addresses the wardrobe malfunction. In Genesis 3, 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, the word here is not the same skimpy word we read for loincloth or belt. It's actually a different kind of garment, a different Hebrew word, referring more to something a lot more covering, a tunic, a, a coat. It's even the word we find in the description of the priestly garments in Leviticus. In other words, guys, God is clothing them with dignity. 
in his mercy and grace. As his response to sin, he has given them what they felt like they needed. They found themselves trying to cover themselves, and he's like, no, 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 I'll cover you. And what's really interesting is it's actually made out of skin. I don't know if you caught that. So this might be the first uh, sacrificial death in Eden, which obviously is ringing some, uh, some all kinds of biblical thread alarms because we know that sacrifice is a response to sin, a need to, to, uh, to purify, and, and, and obviously we see that fulfilled in Jesus, but maybe this is our first hint of it. Clothes is a motif in scripture, and it is part of understanding not only our own inclinations and our own response and, uh, to sin and, and the human condition, but it's also God's way of communicating to us the restoration that we experience when we come to him in our sin and when he graciously sacrifices for us to be in his presence to clothe ourselves with what he provides that we might not feel shameful in presence of one another and in his presence as we chew on the human condition through the unfolding narrative of sin in genesis what we also want to do is, is whet our appetite and deepen our appreciation for what Christ does in answering the fall. We see this fulfilled in the very person of Christ. Check out here what Paul does in Romans. He's using the metaphor of clothing to describe the sanctifying grace of Jesus. In Romans 13, 14, he says, Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? Jesus wants you to put him on. He is what was sacrificed, that you might be clothed in dignity. God is clothing Adam and Eve. Paul is, is saying that that's what we do in Christ, that we actually put on Christ. And so, guys, all that confession stuff coming out of the dark places, and we're afraid of, of being naked, in a sense, in our, in our shame, in our, in our, and vulnerable and, and transparent, there's clothes waiting on the other side of that confession that we come out into that light and, and when we confess Jesus doesn't leave us in our shame he doesn't leave us in our broken and unhealed state he takes his clothes and he puts them on you in fact he clothes you with his own character that that when we see you we see the glorious image of Christ reflected in you. When, when, we see, when God sees us, he sees us as heirs and co-heirs with Christ that, that we have put on Christ and, and he no longer looks as, as, as these huddling um, humans broken in the darkness trying to hide ourselves. But, but we've come into the light and he sees us like he sees Jesus. Just know this. Deep in us, the human condition, I, I think these Genesis stories are, are so worth ruminating and, 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 and marinating in at a slow pace because we see the human condition so clearly. And it cuts deep. Don't you want to hide in your sin? Don't you prefer the darkness when you feel in shame? And yet the invitation of God is there. Where are you? He wants you to come into the light that you might confess, that you might find direction, and that he might clothe you with dignity. Would you experience that in your response to sin? So I hope this has been a helpful meditation on this scene in Genesis, this development and the unfolding narrative of sin as we trace God's beautiful and merciful and dignifying response to human brokenness. Clothe yourself in Christ. Come into the light and be restored. Godspeed. <laughs>